All right, so I'm really excited for my guest. Uh, welcome to uh, Israel Unfiltered. I'm your host, Yoel Israel. And with me, I have someone really cool. I have Yael Ekstein, and uh, he, he runs the, the fellowship, right? The people just know it as the fellowship. Now, first thing I'd like to ask you, Yael, thank you for joining us, is what, well, tell us about the International Fellowship of Christian and Jews. Um, and I kind of want to just get a general idea. And I have a lot of really specific questions because I know, I think there's, there's a problem where when you try to bring two different um, populations or cultures together, there's naturally a stigma, right? Good from far, far from good kind of thing. You also see this within Israel's, uh, in the Jewish community in Israel, you may have between ultra-Orthodox and secular, is that there's very, there's very little, there's some stigma between them. And hopefully what we can do is we can break down these walls and talk about what the fellowship does to raise it. So first, maybe you can give us a little overview for my audience to understand what the fellowship is in case they haven't heard of it. Okay, well, hi, Yoel. Thanks for having me. Um, fun to be with you. So the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews is, um, well, to start at the end, we're the largest philanthropic organization in Israel. We distribute around $150 million annually to uh, three core areas, Aliyah, bringing Jewish people from non-Western at-risk countries to Israel, uh, poverty in Israel and the former Soviet Union, and security. So we've built over 5,500 bomb shelters, um, security drones, emergency centers for the army and uh, police and local municipality workers, uh, securing hospitals against rocket attacks in the periphery. Um, and so really in Israel, wherever you are, you will see the plaque the International Fellowship of Christians and Jews donated with love from Christians in America. Um, and so it started, though, with my father, Rabbi Chiel Eckstein, who he just finished getting his smicha from Rabbi Salavechik. It was in the last late 70s. And he was sent by the ADL to Skokie when there was going to be a Nazi march. And um, naturally, he went looking at the Jewish community to gather this support against the Nazi march. And what he realized was that however big we feel in the Jewish community, um, we are such a small percentage of the population. And uh, even a relatively huge Jewish community in Skokie didn't have a loud enough voice to really make an impact. And it was then that the Christian leaders um, came to my father, who was leading this kind of mobilization against the Nazi march, and said, we want to stand with you. We want to stand against the Nazi march. Um, and that turned into this whole kind of discovery of my father that for the first time in history, the Jewish people have friends. That, that's awesome. Okay, so th that's really cool. A few things. One is, I'm going to get into that story, but why do you chose, the, why are those three things that you guys go into the philanthropy, right? There's so many things that you can do. Why do you focus on, why do you focus on those? Well, one of the really brilliant things that my father did, among many, um, was that he made the organization non-political, which means we work with ever, with whatever government is elected in Israel, in America, our donors, we have over 625,000 donors. And they always write us and ask, who should we vote for? Who's best for Israel and America? And we never take a position on that. And so, um, that leaves the question of, well, why are they supporting Israel? And it comes from a real spiritual perspective that uh, evangelical Christians specifically have returned what they would say back to their biblical roots, which means um, while Catholicism, that used to be the predominant religion in the world, um, and, and definitely amongst Christians, while they focus more on the New Testament and lots of uh, different theology, including replacement theology, and that led to lots of anti-Semitism and even World War II, many people would say, um, against the Jewish people, uh, the evangelical Christians have gone back to study the Tanakh. And when you read the Tanakh, it's all about um, Israel and Abraham and Yitzhak and Yaakov, of course, and, and about the in the Nevi'im and the prophets going, the Jewish people returning to Israel. And so the organization of the fellowship is really based on the spiritual bond that Christians have with Israel and the Jewish people. And that and that's why um, we've decided that for our humanitarian philanthropic aid, it should also be biblically based. So it's those basic needs that that the that the Torah outlines um, of giving food to the hungry and we help the orphans and the widows. And mm. of course, with uh, security, it's nachamu nachamu ami, comfort ye, comfort ye, my people and watchmen on the wall. And hine lo yanum velo ishan, shomer Israel, the guardian of Israel, neither slumbers nor sleeps. And so all these programs are really, and of course, 
Aliyah is directly from, you know, <laughs> the Tanakh and the prophets. Um, and so all the programs that we have are really spiritually and biblically based. Awesome. I, I feel like um, uh, Jews have a lot to learn from, let's say, uh, Christians bringing the morality of Judaism to the forefront. So ho hopefully, uh, I think that's really, I think it's really cool that you're able to to do that and utilize that. Uh, what do you think is the so when what do you think is the biggest uh, uh, let's say I don't say stigma even I didn't say that earlier but let's say uh, ambiguity or unfamiliarity of a lot of Christians what they have about Jews and Israel. And do you think that the cultural differences between uh, American Jews and Israeli Jews um, kind of, how does that play a difference? Because they're very, very different American Jews to Israeli Jews. And these evangelicals, um, the only Jews that they might have met in their personal life or in the culture that they hear about are American Jews and Israeli Jews, the ones that they are helping, um, are very, very different. So uh, I, would, I would like to hear your, uh, your experience there. Well, it's really interesting because kind of what a lot of people say, for good and for bad, um, the evangelical Christians love Israel and the Jewish people because of, uh, because of the scriptures, because of reading the Tanakh and what it says, that it's not something that's cultural, it's not something that's political. And so, of course, as kind of the people of the Bible, we're held to the standards of democracy, of morality. So I think it's very um, affirming that when you look at Israel and you see we're a beacon of light and hope in the Middle East, in the areas of democracy and, you know, an army that just treats human life as sacred um, is very befitting to, you know, what you would call the people of the Bible. Um, but that's not why they support Israel. Kind of the political support that we've seen also from the 80 million evangelicals in America, kind of 25 to 30% of the American voter base, um, that political support doesn't come because Israel is a democracy. It doesn't come because Israel is, uh, you know, the most kind and thoughtful army, people would say, in the world towards uh, valuing human life. But it comes from this spiritual connection. So as far as culture, it's one of those, um, I think it's one of the mistakes, actually, that that Israel and Hasbarah, Israel advocacy, have made is focusing so much on the political and kind of forgetting that really amazing and colorful and exciting and diverse kind of social area of Israel. And so what I always say is I didn't make Aliyah because of the politics. If anything, that would be a reason not to make Aliyah. The reason why I left my comfortable life in America and my family and, you know, the future I thought that I would have there um, to move to Israel that has its own challenges isn't because the government, but it's because, you know, when you're going on when you're driving and on the radio, they say Shana Tova or Shabbat Shalom. And, you know, you get in a cab and he starts telling you about like the, you know, grandmother he visited and her amazing story of escaping Iraq and their, their spiritual history. And you hear him praying and saying, Baruch Hashem, thank God. I mean, it's those details that for me as a culture is just so, um, it's family, it's inviting. It's why I made Aliyah. And that's why kind of on top of um, just the direct philanthropic aid of the fellowship that I oversee, um, on the side, I started some social media accounts just to show our evangelical friends what life is like in Israel. Because too often people abroad only see the politics. They only see the tanks. They only see the war. They only see the fighting. They only see the government kind of... Uh, difficulties that we have here. Um, and so as I opened up this social media account kind of to show the world why I made Aliyah, the beauty of life in Israel day to day, um, organically on Facebook there, I have over um, half a million followers and, you know, multi-million people engagement because people want to see that side. So I guess as a really long answer to your question, I think that um, definitely uh, the evangelical community in America is learning the Israeli culture a lot more also because, of course, with tourism pre-COVID, um, of the 4.2 million uh, tourists that Israel has annually, around half of them are Christian. And so um, 
on top of just kind of being the people of the book, I think more and more Christians are really coming to Israel, feeling it, living it, enjoying it, and, and understanding it a little bit more. Awesome. Very cool. Uh, so you're talking about like the culture of like ooh, the really cool feeling of, you know, it's just uh, is that Jewish culture is really embedded in, into conversation. You hear it on the radio and, you know, and it's, it's universal, whether you're secular or religious. Um, and that's actually really astonishing because you actually you kind of you feel the, the spirit, the deeper spiritual, even if anything you're discussing might be no connection to religious or spirituality at all, because the culture, the culture has done that. And it's awesome that you're able to connect that culture. In addition to these very small yeah. moments, do you ever have, uh, have you ever had like one of those so-called only in Israel moments that you like felt something that was like a real deep, significant impact on you culturally that, you know, this could only happen here in Israel? Oh my gosh. I feel like every day those happen, right? Right. Yeah. yeah I feel like <laughs> as long as I leave my house. You could write books on that. Exactly. You could stay in your house and like the Amazon right. delivery man who like comes in and asks you for a blessing or like right, a cup right, of water. Right. And he stands right. there and like puts his hand on his head because he's not wearing a yarmulke and like makes right. a blessing and drinks the water. I mean, every single day there are so many of those, but I guess the, the one that, um, I'm in this stage of raising teenagers and um, I was a teenager in America and it's a very different culture. And one of the biggest things I think um, that really defines the difference between growing up in America and growing up in Israel is that when I was growing up, kind of like every parent, my parents always told me, don't talk to strangers. Don't talk to strangers. It was kind of like the most important rule that you are vulnerable and you cannot make yourself, you know, at all a target, God forbid, for someone who's crazy and, and could do bad things to you. So you just don't even get close to strangers. And, you know, using that kind of precedence of my childhood, um, there's a very, very different kind of slogan that I tell my children that is actually the complete opposite. I tell my kids, if you need anything, you ask the person next to you. And every time <laughs> they leave that. the house, yeah, anytime they leave the house, you know, whether they're going, taking a bus, like my 13 year old taking a bus by himself cross country to go camping with his friends, which is totally normal here. You know, it's like, if you need anything on the bus, you ask the person next to you. If your phone dies, you ask the bus driver. If you're camping and you run out of the water, you ask the, you know, if you need some water to drink, you ask the family who's in the tent next to you. And it's really just this culture of taking care of each other. And it's a, you know, we talk about social responsibility. And I feel like in so many countries, this concept of social responsibility is such a macro concept, kind of like you have to give money to the starving people in Africa, or you have to like, click like on a social media page for some really important cause. And in Israel, I feel like it really gets down to the micro, like you take care of that person sitting next to you. Like if you see that there's some weirdo on the bus and there's a child sitting alone you don't look the other way you stand up and you go and you walk with the child off the bus and call their parents and wait for them to come um and so I guess it's you know specifically in 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 motherhood when I go to the park and my kid falls like before I could even get to them there are 15 parents that are helping them up and you know giving them water and so it's everywhere it's really everywhere just transforming that mundane into holy yeah, that, that's really cool. Uh, yesterday morning, I, I woke up really early, depressingly early, 4.50 in the morning. And after I couldn't fall back asleep in a half hour, I was like, all right, so I'll go to the beach for sunrise. So I drove over uh, and I was pulling up at like, uh, it was like almost six o'clock. And there were just like two girls there, like just uh, hiking on their own, two like 14, 13, 14 year old girls with a full backpack and everything. It was just like, where do they go? Where are they coming from? They probably just packed up their tent and just continued onward. And I thought that, I found them to be really, uh, really fascinating. And it was, you know, that was my yesterday, just like only as a just observation. I don't know if you'd call that a moment, but you, you get that too. And it is true about the micro. And I think there's something about that. And to kind of tie it back a little bit to like the religious is that there is something uh, about personal responsibility. Those sometimes they give to something far away from them because it makes them feel good. Uh, but nothing really makes you, I think you feel good, um, but it's harder is take the personal responsibility. If you see something yeah. within your community, um, if you see someone next to you and, you know, and the Torah teaches you, you know, you should first help your, your community, right? your neighborhood, your neighbors, and, you know, maybe your town, your city, your state, your country, you know, these are the places, you know, um, you should always look for these opportunities that are closer to home. 
often geographically, totally. but also spiritually also too. That's really important. And you do get that. Uh, you do get that a lot from, uh, from Israel. Uh, so, so the fellowship is really fascinating. So tell me this thing. Um, my audience are Jews. So w- tell me, what can they understand about the American Christian community or maybe Christian community or evangelical community at, at large? Um, because there is a little, there's a little skepticism, particularly when it comes from the evangelical. Um, I would say for those that haven't ever spoken to an evangelical would say, oh, they're only doing it because of Jesus or things like that. Uh, you know what I mean? And that they have, um, or something, a term that I despise, ulterior motives, because I know that's not true. Um, and I think it's a, dis- I, and I don't like the term. I think it's, I think it's, I think it's a disgusting term. Um, but what would you say to those that haven't had the opportunity to meet evangelicals? And let's say they don't have an easy opportunity to meet them. Let's say, cause they're here in Israel as an example. Well, it's interesting. I think the relationship between the Jewish slash Israeli uh, community or pro-Israel community and the evangelical community has really um, evolved as um, the fellowship was established in 1978. um, And it was such, it was a taboo subject. Like evangelical Christians, they either want to kill us or convert us. That's it. What else would they want with us? And that was what my father saw by actually sitting down and talking to them is no, no, no. They don't want to kill us. They don't want to convert us. They want to bless us. They want to stand with us. There's uh, every evangelical will quote quote, Genesis 12, three, I will bless those who bless Israel and I will curse those who curse Israel. And they say, as Gentiles, this is my opportunity to be blessed by God. Um, And so I think that there's both kind of historic, uh, of course, baggage in the relationship. Um, You know, Christians that we know about are the Christians that we learned about in history class, that 70% of Nazis identified as Christian. And of course the Spanish Inquisition, and I mean, you can go over example, example, example. And so I think what the Jewish com- community doesn't realize is a few things. Number one, um, in Christianity, there are so many different sects and it's not the same as in Judaism where um, you can have, you know, Chabad and Breslov or I don't know, any other. And if your kids get married, you're so happy and you're, you know, fully supportive. In Christianity, these sects, it's called inner marriage if they get married. Um, I've been with evangelical groups. I remember one of the biggest eye-opening experiences for me was when I was with a group of evangelicals from America and Israel. They were touring ground and we went into a church. And they said, we don't want to be in this idol worshiping space that the Catholics took over, built a church. And, you know, this has nothing to do with us. And and as I started to explore, I realized the evangelical movement is like they identify even as a different religion, kind of, you know, And, and as far as replacement theology that was so prominent in the Catholic church and has recently been denounced and, you know, but kind of the theology is still very much integrated into Catholicism. Um, Evangelicals, it's it's kind of a a core tenant to love and bless Israel and not try to convert the Jewish people and not try to, you know, just simply to love, to bless. And so um, what I would say in that area is, is what I say also to kind of Jewish people I speak to and Christian people I speak to, um, the Jewish people should never let their guard down ever. (laughs) The Jewish people should always have their guard up. That's why we have survived thousands of years, despite all odds. And yet we also have to recognize when we have an opportunity for the first time in history for a real friendship and strategic partnership with hundreds of millions of people when we ourselves, the Jewish people, are 15 million kind of at best. uh, while keeping our guards up, we also have to be open, communicative, and, and have these discussions of how we can work together. But the second thing that I would say on that topic, as far as how um, Jewish people relate to evangelical Christ- Christians and maybe some misunderstandings, is also, um, I think, American Jews know Christians through the lens of politics. And uh, most Jewish people in America vote Democrat, while most Christians vote Republican. And there are a lot of um, issues that the Jewish community and Christian community don't necessarily see eye to eye on, for example, pro-life, pro-choice. That's why kind of what the International Fellowship 
of Christians and Jews comes and does is we come and say, let's not deal with any of those other issues. Let's not even touch them. Let's not get near politics. Let's not get near pro-life, pro-choice. Let's not get near immigration or taxes or anything like that. Let's find this one issue that we can agree on, that we do have partnership on, that we can strengthen one another on, and let's really focus on that. And so the only focus and only issue that we get involved in is support for Israel. And I think that's really why we've seen such kind of historic success. Uh, that's awesome. And you know, they say, uh, you have, we have a lot more common than we, than we, than the problem is that we always focus on what we don't have in common, right? Our differences. There's human, we take acknowledge that's human nature and human nature is flawed. Um, and people know that. So right, we, we have a lot of like a, a Tikkun and improvements to do in that world. Um, I was speaking to a, a friend of mine and we were talking about something we disagree on strongly. And uh, and I stopped for a second. And I was like, you know, we agree on like 90% of things at least. But here we are often just like for fun discussing the things that we don't instead of, right. you know what I mean? And I was like, we're not going to move either of each other on this. We're more likely right. to move something of things that we actually agree overwhelmingly on and expand our perspectives. And there's so much work that can be done as humanity, not just not just, you know, cross face that we can make a huge, 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 huge impact on just by focusing on the things that we agree with. Um, but I think everyone needs to like fight that urge to see like, oh, they have an, uh, they have an other opinion, right. Or an other, or other priorities or other things. But it's really at the end of the day, we really, you know, 90% of us want 90, 90% of the same things. And we need to stop focusing on the 10% of people, you know, or the 10% that we don't agree on. I think that's a, a huge mistake. So you mentioned that the fellowship, you opened it by saying that it's a philanthropic organization. Um, I have a question about the the growing Christian community, I think in Africa and China, and not, not that you, the, the Chinese has no access really to them because of the communists. Um, do you, since it's philanthropy, is there reason, is that why you're mostly focused in America? Because, and how does the growing Christian population um, in certain parts of the world, uh, how does that play into partnership with, um, with you think, we think um, Israel and the Jewish people um, expanding um, her friendships and shared values across the world? Um, well, the fellowship has offices in North America, kind of in Chicago, in Canada, and we have in Korea, in Seoul. And so, um, yeah. And so uh, it's amazing, the growing Christian population. They say in China, there's around 100 million Christians. Yeah. In Korea, it's growing by huge percentages every year. Um, and what's amazing is that, of course, they're kind of first, second, maximum, third generation Christians. And so it's really new, both from a cultural perspective, like so much of Christianity that we know in the West is also either in response to or against, <laughs> kind of for or against the cultural um, progress that we've seen within monotheism and um, creating a monotheist, monotheistic uh, culture. But in the in Asia, and it's a very different reality. So what's really interesting is, for example, when I speak to um, some of our donors in Korea, um, one of the things that they ask me all the time is, what's the place of family? Where, where, how do we integrate community? How do we pass on faith to our children? Some of these core questions that as a culture that has had kind of Judaism, Christianity, Islam as the core of our uh, values that we've already kind of gotten over that. We're already kind of, yeah, yeah, we've been 1500 years dealing with that question that, okay, we see assimilation, we have to stop and, and reassess our um, strategies and in integrating the next generation and connecting them to faith, but we still have it pretty down as a given. Um, in Asia, all these questions are being formed uh, new. And so just like these questions are being asked of what's the position of family, what's the position of woman, what's the position of community, education, next generation, um, the question of Israel is also coming up. And I look at it as a huge opportunity. And what I always say to um, all the Jewish people that I speak to, which are many in a lot of leadership roles or government roles or ambassador roles or high tech roles, is don't take it as a given that Christians are Israel's friends. It's not a given. It's a new phenomenon. 
And if we don't invest in it, and if we don't focus on education and um, strategic partnership and benefits for both sides, we're going to lose them. It's not, uh, it's not kind of synonymous to be Christian and pro-Israel. It's something that we've invested in and spent a lot of time and a lot of sweat and hardship making sure that it got to where it is today to the place that you see the tangible outcomes of it, that the American embassy was moved to Jerusalem was because of the pressure of the Christian community. It's one of my close friends and board member, um, Reverend Johnny Moore, that was a big part of creating and fostering the ties for the Abraham Accords that he went with a lot of uh, Christian delegations to Arab, to Arab nations and made sure that this happened. Um, it's not a given. And so when we say there's such a rise, rise in the number of Christians in the Far East, I look at that definitely as an opportunity, but not as a given that, oh, they'll be our friends. Um, for example, a lot of Christians in the Far East are, are, are connecting to Lutheranism right. and um, that is has a lot of anti-Semitism, anti-Jewish, anti-Israel, what would, you know, turn into anti-Israel sentiment, um, that unless we invest in these strategic ties with the rising Christian community, we're going to lose them. How much of that responsibility is on, let's say, Christians and how much is on Jews to, uh, to maybe to, to not lose them as friends? I mean, it's on, it's on anyone who cares. It's on anyone who cares. And there's definitely Christians trying to integrate this philosophy of standing with Israel and the Jewish people and tapping into their biblical roots. And there's a lot of Christian teachings in order to support it. For example, in Romans, in the Christian Bible, it says um, Christians are grafted onto the rich olive tree of Israel. And to never forget, even more than the roots need the branches, the branches need the roots. I mean, there's so much um, scripture both, of course, from the Tanakh, which is the real base for uh, Christian support for Israel, but even in the New Testament, but it, it's all a matter of education and investment. So um, I think that a lot, of, a lot of Christians who do stand with Israel, that comes with a whole package. It's not kind of uh, this one core value that's different from anything right. else, but part of a whole lifestyle and philosophy and connection to their Christian faith, um, that definitely they have an interest in making sure in the Far East, we, they see this kind of peaceful, loving, um, uh, spiritual Christianity grow. But of course, it's up to the Jewish community and up to Israel diplomatically to do everything we can to see this as an opportunity. Uh, I wanted to highlight something that you said that the Koreans asked, how can we teach our family or our kids um, uh, about Israel? Uh, Dennis Prager has said a few times, which I'm sure your audience is familiar with, uh, he said one of the biggest challenges as Americans that we'll, in the, uh, people of faith is that we so wanted to give our kids everything that they didn't have, right? Uh, opportunity, money, technology, freedom, and all these things we didn't have growing up. Um, but we forgot to give them all the great things that we did have, which included, right. you know, of a faith, uh, deep family values, you know, things like that. So yeah. it, it's important that we're always trying to strive for what we don't have. But let's not leave some of the the main the, the roots of, of 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 our of our core values. You know, we don't want to leave that behind, so we can bring that with us to the next generation. Because if not, we might lose them in, within two generations. And yeah, um, if you don't yeah. know where you came from, you can't know right. where you're going. Right, right, and also to make sure, like you know, you're faith based. Because if not, then the, the, the your values will very easily be 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 swayed away. Uh, yeah. Be away. Yeah, I find that uh, the, uh, the the diversity within the Christian community is actually really fascinating, and I'm pretty ignorant. I only I read about it, but I haven't embraced it. I remember when I was at college at the Temple University, one of my business schools, uh, I was seeing up this really sweet uh, this really sweet girl. She was uh, like a Southern Baptist. I think she was like a Black Southern Baptist, and it was Purim, and we had like uh, we 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 were working on an assignment together, um, and Purim was coming. I was like, okay, let's meet the stage. Like, oh, I can't. It's Purim. She's like, what's that? And she was like, she was very, like, very, very religious, very Jesus focused. And I was like, oh, it's, just, it's a holiday where, like, we celebrate, you know, whatever we're going to be done. Like, basically, I'm going to get wasted um, until the point I don't understand the difference between uh, good and evil. And she goes, that's what's wrong with you Jews. And I'm like, okay, you go do work. I go drink. I'll see you on Monday. <laughs> like, and that, but it's that a very, the, the yeah, the my, thing is that, that was, sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. I was, no, I just wanted to say, like, like, like unfortunately, 
you know, growing up in like a very liberal, very Zionist home in Philly, uh, that was like my first time I ever like spoke to or had any experience with a religious Christian, which was fabulous, by the way. But it was just like kind of like the little culture. I was like, huh? I was like, what? I was like, whatever. And, but it was it was, it was it, and especially u- university. I mean, this is like uh, 18 years ago, you know, so uh, so secular, so anti, you know, religious or people of faith. Um, I'm sure it's even more rare to come by that today. Um, but yeah, th- that's kind of, that, that's all we get. Um, I think many Jews that come from very urban centers, uh, they don't get the opportunity to meet other, um, meet Christians of, of all stripes. Right. Here's the thing, though, that looking back kind of from adult eyes, that was such a missed opportunity because right. I'm right. sure your <laughs> Christian Baptist uh, friend knew all about Esther and all about Haman and all about the story of Purim that sometimes um, when I work with Christians, that it brings me back to kind of that core as well. Why am I doing this? That it's not just about we get so caught up in routine and in tradition, which of course is amazing. And that's what makes, you know, religion special and what we have passed on to the children. Um, But I realize how, how much we sometimes stray from the reasons why we do things, the core. And once you get back to the core, you could find so many commonalities. For example, when I started speaking to Christians, something I heard all the time that made me so uncomfortable was you're the chosen nation. I'd be like, "Mm, I'm not sure how I feel about that. We don't really talk about that. We don't really say that. What do you mean you don't talk about that? You don't say that. It says it in the Bible, you know? I'm like, well, uh-huh. we do say it in Kiddush when we make the blessing on the wine uh-huh. every Shabbat. We say it, you know. Um, well, we know it's olam. not spoken about. Also, it's kind of like it just doesn't. Right, relevant. but it but it forced me to explore why it is relevant. Because if you believe in Judaism and you believe that Kilu Moshe Eret Emet Bitorato Emet that that the Torah is true, then then somehow all these things are relevant to us every day and to the world. And so it got me kind of exploring what does that mean to be Am Nivchal, the chosen nation. And what I found was from Rav Shlomo Karlbach, that who said, um, what does it mean to be the chosen nation? It means that God chose the Jewish people to tell the whole world that they're chosen. And it's something that like made so much sense to me because suddenly it's not like I'm better than anyone else. No, I have a responsibility. This is, right. and, and actually this interfaith work is exactly the responsibility of Am Nivchal. The Jewish people brought this world to a monotheistic world that we know today through the Jewish people came, of course, Christianity and Islam and the monotheistic world that we know today. And so it's through being the chosen nation that we're able to transform the entire universe from idol worshippers to monotheistic faith that somehow all these things are um are so relevant and specifically by being forced to ask myself how is this relevant to you what does this mean to you in order to give it over to other people um has really helped me on my journey as well wait can you answer the question you asked yourself what well, you ask yourself, what does it mean to you? Can you? Uh, right. No, that's, I mean, that's what it means it, to me. It's responsibility. It's responsibility. responsibility yeah. To, scare to tell the world that they're chosen. Because sometimes Does, I, I joke to people, like, if I wasn't Jewish, I would probably be, uh, you know, I'd probably be a stoner in uh, the Rockies in Colorado going skiing regularly. That's probably because there, there is this sense of responsibility of being a Jew. And I think that's what turns unfortunately i think that's what scares so many people and i think it's a cultural shift a generational shift uh rather is that uh, in the west unfortunately i think it's terrible um i think it's cross face of kind of like you know be taken care of don't take responsibility you know what i mean kind of thing it's kind of like never kind of grow up i feel like there's a little bit of that and i think that's kind of a generational thing of being forced to take responsibility which is a very jewish thing that's why we have bar and bat mitzvah it's like whether you like it or not uh you're an adult now so uh you know, you're now you're now responsible for your actions. I think we need to uh, force and encourage uh, more responsibility for people to take up that mantle themselves. I don't know, that's kind of how I see it. You were saying earlier about um, you you mentioned I was thinking it had me thinking how Jewish people kind of like you know we are we're reminded by you know the, the blessings to be the chosen people, um, and we get that reminder in uh, like you were saying in your interactions with Christians and evangelicals. Um, and it seems to me that like, um, do you, you know, like 
who needs who more? Like sometimes, like, you know, do Jews need Christians more, Christians need Jews more? The obvious answer is like, like many other partnerships, it's you, you need, you need to both indefinitely, you both need each other indefinitely, right? There is no number, there is no finite, there isn't 50-50, it's 100%, 100% kind of thing. Um, why do you think, uh, why do you think uh, Christians need Jews? I think, I think Christians or evangelicals at least pay a very important reminder um, to the Jewish people, um, from a friendly reminder, as opposed to the many unfriendly reminders that we get from most of the world. Um, what do you think, uh, why do Christians need Jews? Is it just to be, so they can be blessed because of the great opportunities for them from their faith? Or is there anything be, is there anything beyond, is there anything beyond that? Wow. I mean, I think, I think there's so much there. First of all, um, yeah, like Jew, Jews are the roots of their faith. I was just talking the other day about kosher with my audience and they said, you know, why do you not eat this and what's kosher? And I said, well, this is actually how Jesus lived. If you want to explore how Jesus lived, he would have not eaten milk and meat and he would have not eaten sea, sea shellfish and he would have followed those biblical commandments to, you know, not cook a, not cook a baby in its mother's milk and only fins and scales. And, um, and, and so really the Jewish people are preserving a very important part of the Christian faith. I think many Christians are starting to really recognize that, that within Jewish, Jews don't go out and, and evangelize. We don't go and try to get people to become Jewish. And so, um, I, so I've heard, and, and Christians who, who do do that with their faith, um, it, lately, especially in the past 50 years, there's, there's been a lot of talk of, yeah, but don't touch Jews. Like the Jews don't need Jesus. The rest of the world that were idol worshipers and, you know, all these different things. The Jewish people were the first monotheistic faith. They don't need Christianity. Um, that is, it's an interesting discussion kind of on that philosophy and, and the complexities within it. Um, but of course, also we have the Genesis 12, three, bless those, uh, those who bless Israel, be blessed and a lot of evangelical Christians would say this is our source of blessing and and many even churches that support the fellowship have like graphs showing you know amazing god stories what they would call it of when they started helping israel and so that suddenly their finances changed or you know a check that they weren't expecting came in or literal graphs showing it and it's not like a harig it's not like an exceptional thing i have seen so many um, that, that I never, you know, use Judaism as like a, a witch tale of like, do this and it will happen, do this and you'll be blessed. And, but, um, but, but, you know, you also have to believe if it says something in the Torah that it's true. Um, and then the third thing I would say also is, uh, or maybe the third, but out of four is that, um, when you read the Nevi'im, our prophets, when you read about Isaiah and Jeremiah and prophecy revolves around the Jewish people and the Jewish people coming home to Israel. And, you know, that's why it's no wonder there's never been a nation that was exiled for 2000 years and then returned to their homeland. I mean, this is something divine and hard to close your eyes to. And the fourth and final thing that I would say is a lot of Christians um, in America are very, 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 um, American. They love America. They've served in the American army. They're very involved in what they believe is best for America and very proud Americans and proud of the democracy and the values that America stands for. And I think specifically Christians do have this huge appreciation and recognition for the kind of miracle of a democratic tiny state with 9 million people in the middle of the Middle East that is somehow a thriving democracy and freedom that that I think the whole world needs that, honestly. Yeah, I, I would definitely agree the whole world needs that. Why do you think, let's, uh, this is a, a little change of topic, it's related, but what do you think it is about the Jewish community that kind of uh, greater, I mean, obviously this, I'm speaking in large general swaths, um, but they don't, many people just don't see the miracle, like, right, because even uh, even Ben-Gurion, right, the prime minister, the first prime minister of Israel and founded right, the third state of Israel in, in the land of Israel. And he said he was an atheist, he was an atheist, but he also, first of all, knew the Tanakh and the Torah in and out. And he said, you know, you, was, you can't believe in miracles, like, 
you, you, you can't you can't be a Zionist without believing in miracles or like like he, he a realist in a Israel realist. to right. be a realist right. is to believe in miracles. So they believe yeah. in miracles, right? So why do you think um, the um, and I, I, I believe this is a growing thing in the West, but let's focus on Jewish people or not. It depends on your answer. That there's people shy away from like the fact like. Things are miracles. Like I remember growing up here and people say, "Oh, it's a miracle." Like something great happened. You know. Now I feel like it's kind of been worked out, maybe of our uh, of our vocabulary. That people are kind of scared to say that you know they they know that something that was beyond that can be explained or comprehended that there is a, a spiritual or greater aspect can be involved or partnered in in our life directly or indirectly. Um, do um, do you find that to be like? Do you find that to be a challenge with kind of? within the Jewish community in general, that there's kind of, you know, I feel like, we, I feel like we, we've lost something to a subject. Well, I a think smackment. it's, I think that it's, um, my first, my first thoughts are, oh, I bless all those people to never need a miracle. You know, um, those people have never lived in 1948 when they were Holocaust survivors without any arms and right. every army attacking them. They've never lived in 1967 when suddenly, you know, Israel was going to be wiped into the sea. They've never lived on Yom Kippur surprise war when Israel was taken totally, you know, without um, by surprise uh, attacked. And so, so I think that uh, the farther that we just naturally, the farther that we come from uh, away from these miracles, um, the less emotional it is. I mean, you talk to anyone uh, who has lived in 1948, and it wasn't a question if this was a miracle or not. It doesn't matter what religion you are. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you're Israel's enemy or friends. Even the enemies acknowledged, like, this can't be. This just, al piteva, according to the rules of nature, this shouldn't be. Um, it's a miracle. And so I think I think with everything you talk about, like, Yitzhak Mitzrayim, you know, leaving of Egypt and the sea splitting, like, when we talk about that now, are we like, that's a miracle. You know, you have like, maybe it didn't exactly happen like that. Maybe, you know, mm -hmm. you're not blown away by it because you didn't, you don't have that uh, emotional firsthand experience with it. Um, and so I think the more we could just relay history um, and, and try to, you know, it goes back to what we were saying before, the more that you know where you came from, the more you can know where you're going, the more you understand what it means to be, you know, wandering <laughs> Jews for 2,500 years and then to be reunited with Israel and to think we're the third generation here, the more you could understand the significance of that. Um, so I think, I don't, I don't think that just like not recognizing the miracle of Israel is actually the core problem. I think the core problem is, is not understanding enough. If, if you don't understand the miracle of Israel, it means you don't understand the, um, kind of fundamentals of our history or world history. And, and so maybe that's what I would think is missing a little bit more. I, I think what he said is beautiful. This it's like we should never, God willing, we should never need a miracle, but we should all be blessed enough to experience miracles. You know what I mean? Like, Amen. So, uh, so that's what it should be. Fantastic. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. Where can people learn more about the fellowship and your podcast? And I, I know you have a lot of going on. You have a huge social media following. How can people learn more about the fellowship and how can they get involved? Well, Thank you. We we have our website, www.ifcj.org. Um, you can Google us, International Fellowship of Christians and Jews, and find lots of material. I have a weekly podcast on the Parsha called Nourish Your Biblical Roots. Um, and of course, on social media, you could find me anywhere at Yael Eckstein. Thank you, Yael. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yael Israel of Israel Unfiltered.